Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 286, Is the Trinity Essential? Three Views. Recently, evangelical apologist and philosopher Dr. William Lane Craig released a short video entitled, Is the Trinity Essential? And this was commented on at some length by Reformed apologist Dr. James White. In this episode, their views and mine. In my view, the exchange between them reveals a lot about evangelical ideology versus its actual practice. Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. My name is James White, and we're asking the question today, is the Trinity essential? And you might ask yourself, why would we bother asking that question? Because we've answered it many times. I've edited a bit out here where he discusses how long he's been an apologist and how very many times he's addressed these sorts of things before. I also cut a bit here where he meanders regarding the importance of the Bible and his disbelief in any present-day revelation. Finally, though, he manages to get to the point. So, the point is, we have certainly addressed it, so why would we be addressing it today? Well, because a video came out from William Lane Craig. I don't follow William Lane Craig, not for any other reason than there's only, you can only meaningfully follow so many people. But a Muslim friend of mine sent me the link and said, thoughts? So here are my thoughts. So we're going to listen to the comments and respond to what William Lane Craig had to say. Let's just jump into it and see, see how it goes. The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is not just one person. That's called Unitarianism. Trinitarianism says that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right here, there's a problem with what Dr. Craig says. He's talking in the apologetics vein, as if the doctrine of the Trinity is some one set of claims, which could be true or false. But as he well knows, what's been mandated by small-c Catholic traditions is language. And even just the statement that God exists in three persons, what's a person? Is it an intelligent being, like a self? Or is it just a personality, or an aspect, or a mode, or something like that? Who knows? He's not going to tell us in this context. Right, but by meaning different things by persons, you get different doctrines. To just say God exists in three persons, that isn't really specific enough to be true or false. Now within people who adhere to these language rules mandated by small-c Catholic traditions, There are people urging very different doctrines. What Dr. William Lane Craig thinks the Trinity is, is really not the same as what Dr. Brian Leftow of Oxford University thinks the Trinity is. And those two things are very different from what Dr. Mike Ray of the University of Notre Dame thinks the Trinity is. And those three things are different from what famous Christian philosopher and apologist Dr. Peter Van Inwagen thinks the Trinity is. Not according to me, according to them, and according to Dr. Craig, if one of these theories about God is true, then the other three will be false. They're mutually exclusive theories, and yet each of them intends to be, each of them is offered as a way to intelligibly interpret the words that Catholic traditions mandate. Dr. Craig knows all of this. He contrasts in one place his own approach where you actually interpret the traditional language with what he calls a merely formulaic approach. If you're serious about truth and falsity, you can't just ape the language. You have to give an interpretation of the language which you think is true and plausible, and moreover, which is actually implied by Christian scripture. I think that this doctrine is right at the core of the Christian faith. It serves to distinguish Christianity from Judaism and Islam, which are both forms of Unitarianism. We believe that God is tri-personal rather than unipersonal. Notice that how before he even says what the Trinity is, 
he employs a rhetoric of us versus them, right? Whatever this Trinity theory is, whatever all this business amounts to, it's ours. It's our precious truth. And these outsiders are against it. So if you're with us, you're for whatever it is we're talking about, this Trinity stuff. And it's those other guys, those unbelieving Jews and those Muslims who are members of a false religion, those guys are denying it. So if you're with us, you've got to be down with this Trinity language, whatever it means. That's effective rhetoric, but it's not relevant to the truth of the matter, is it? And worse than that, it gives one the false impression that there aren't any non-Trinitarian Christians. But of course, there are many. First, there are Unitarian Christians like me, people who know that they're not Trinitarians. But also, there are many non-Trinitarians who live and breathe in officially Trinitarian churches, as you'll hear later in this episode. But Dr. Craig prefers to pretend that this matter of, quote, the Trinity is just all Christians at all times versus everyone else. Again, effective rhetoric, but not accurate. But let's let Dr. Craig continue. I don't think that it's necessarily essential to salvation, however. For example, I think that Abraham and Moses will be in heaven. They were saved, but they didn't believe the doctrine of the Trinity. They'd sure. never heard of it. Right. And similarly, I imagine there are people today, people on the mission field who hear the gospel preached over the shortwave radio, who place their faith in Christ and are saved, who don't understand or have an appreciation of the doctrine of the Trinity. And sadly, there may be people in our churches, frankly, who do not understand and believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, it's worse than he lets on, as you'll hear later in this episode. In addition to all those examples that he gives, just take someone who goes down to receive Christ at an evangelistic crusade, like the old Billy Graham crusades. Look at the materials given to counselors. Do they counsel the people coming down for repentance and salvation? Do they counsel them on the Trinity? No, they don't. It's part of evangelical tradition to try to base things on the Bible. And there is no requirement in the Bible of believing in the Trinity. You don't see this presented anywhere, in any passage, in any fashion. To just take a famous example, look at Acts chapter 2, which is Luke's presentation of basically the first Christian sermon by Peter, preached on Pentecost. There's nothing that even sounds like the Trinity there. And there isn't even anything that sounds like, quote, the deity of Christ. But it does sound like what a biblical Unitarian, like me, preaches. Read it for yourself, Acts chapter 2. So this feature of evangelical tradition, I think, is wise and is based on the Bible. But it doesn't sit well with the traditional small-c Catholic demand that this is a totally central, all-important teaching. And it doesn't agree in particular with the famous so-called Athanasian Creed, which merely damns anyone who does not accept its paradoxical version of Trinitarian teaching. Back to Dr. Craig. But nevertheless, they are believing in Christ as Savior and believing that He is divine, well, that He's the Lord. What does that mean? And so I don't think that belief in the Trinity is essential to salvation. So this is another feature of Bible-oriented evangelicalism. The Trinity, on a practical level, they couldn't care less about. What they do care about is the deity of Christ. But they don't go into all the traditional Chalcedonian stuff about two natures. Basically, they just think Jesus is God himself. They talk like that. They think like that, except when they are reading the Bible and they realize that God is someone and Jesus is someone else. Moreover, someone else who's a man. But back to Dr. Craig. The doctrine of the Trinity, I think, lies at the core of Christianity because Why would one think it explains that? to us who God is and what he is like. And if you deny the doctrine of the Trinity, you're probably going to be denying either the deity of Christ, which would mean that you don't understand who he really is. Notice the he and the who. Like other Bible-oriented evangelicals, he thinks of God as a single self. 
how to square this with his own Trinity theory, well, that's another interesting conversation. But he's right in so doing, because this is how God is always described in the Bible. However, that self in the Bible is the Father. That's who is explicitly the only true God, and moreover, the God over Jesus. What this illustrates is a deep foundational crack in American evangelical thinking. What they intend to do is to base everything on the Bible. What they actually do is rely equally or even more fundamentally on post-biblical, small-c Catholic traditions. And you're about to hear Dr. Craig spout a few right now. You think he's just another human being like you, which is just utterly inadequate. You cannot worship him. If he's just a human Says being, who? that would be idolatry the New and blasphemy Revelation to five. worship Jesus if he's only human. And yet we are called upon to worship Jesus. He must be divine. The mistakes come so fast here. And again, this is all just kind of off the shelf apologetics material that I don't think Dr. Craig has properly thought through. For one thing, if Jesus is human and not divine, it doesn't at all follow that he's no different than, you know, Dale Tuggy or William Lane Craig or James White. In the New Testament, it's a big, huge deal to be God's Messiah. It means you're very unlike ordinary humans. You've been called to play this role from before your birth. You've been given God's spirit without measure. You've been given this special message and mission and power by God to accomplish it. You lived a sinless life. You died to provide this atoning sacrifice. You're vindicated by God and raised to his right hand. That's foolish to describe a being like that as just like you or me, or even as being a, quote, mere man. The old polemical term initially coined against people who did not like Logos theories in the late 100s. So that's one just blazing non sequitur, or if you like, you could characterize the mistake as a false dichotomy, that either Jesus is God or that Jesus is fully divine on the one hand, or he's just a mere man or not relevantly different than you or me on the other. No, there's a third option, which is that he's God's human Christ, his Messiah. Another big mistake here is that the Old Testament and New Testament do not ever say that necessarily, in any circumstances whatever, worshiping a human counts as a sin of idolatry. It doesn't say that. And it's a good thing it doesn't say that anywhere, because Jesus is presented in the New Testament as a man, but a man whom we should worship. Why? Because God wants us to. On the blog post for this episode at trendies.org, I'll put a link for a couple of blog posts that I've done in the past discussing the work of the late Dr. Larry Hurtado, a historical specialist in the early history of Christianity who discusses the New Testament grounds for worshiping Jesus. And contrary to Dr. Craig's talking point, the New Testament nowhere says, implies, or even presupposes that the reason Jesus must be given religious worship is that he is God or that he has a divine nature. The reason is that in the view of these authors, in fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel 7, with the one like a son of man, God has exalted Jesus to his right hand. And this is portrayed in Revelation chapter 5. And Paul says that the worship given to Jesus is to the glory of God the Father. So they're not worried about religious worship given to Jesus because they know that he's not being presented as a rival God or as the same God. Rather, he's the Son of God. And if you honor him, you thereby honor the one who sent him. So he's not in competition with God for honor. They still view worship as ultimately and centrally focused on the one true God, which is to say the Father. However, they do think that Jesus too should be worshipped. If Dr. Craig wants to get serious about the truth of the matter and go beyond just these basic standard apologist talking points, then I encourage him to interact with the arguments in my podcast, presentation, or paper entitled, Who Should Christians Worship? In that presentation, I deal with all the main passages. I offer a definition of the sin of idolatry. I talk about some of the relevant worship-related vocabulary. And I think that I show there that there really just is no support here for any traditional trinity theory or even for some type of two-nature Christology. 
Okay. So Dr. Craig is kind of just going through a list of what he views as standard mistakes. So here he brings up the Holy Spirit. Or the person might deny the person of the Holy Spirit. But then that again would be to deny one of the persons that God is and to deny his work in the world and in salvation. The Holy Spirit is absolutely essential to our salvation. It is he who draws us to God, who convicts us of sin, and who regenerates us and brings about the new birth, who then indwells us and enables us to live the Christian life. Suppose the Holy Spirit is a third divine person and does the things that Dr. Craig thinks that this divine person does. If you just think that this is really God's power, is this really, quote, denying the Spirit or denying that these are divine works occurring? Should it be equated with kind of resisting God or fighting against God's grace or anything like that? It's hard to see how. I think Dr. Craig is just casting around for some reason why, supposedly, it would be terrible if Christian thought God's Spirit was a power given to believers, as it's most often portrayed in the Bible, rather than thinking that this Spirit is a divine person in addition to the Father and Son, as Catholic traditions insist. When the Trinity's podcast returns, the deep thoughts of Dr. James White on the video we just heard. With all due respect to Brother Craig, when I first saw this, Phil Johnson had tweeted it, and he had the, the best commentary. He said, this is just muddled. And it is. It's muddled on, on every level. Every level. Oh, dear. First of all, the doctrine of the Trinity given was rather inadequate. It assumed a number of things. It did not emphasize monotheism. It assumed anyone asking the question was al already understood the necessity of monotheism, which as a philosopher, I'm sure that's the primary thing he's dealing with. But those of us that are out here in the trenches are dealing with a lot of other things other than that. Uh, and so we do have polytheists and uh, other perspectives to work with. So when he talks about God being tri-personal, he does not differentiate between being in person, a person who needs that information to, to understand the difference between the fact there's one being of God three divine persons being in person are not the same thing. All of that is passed over in the giving of the definition. So what Dr. White is doing is he's complaining that not enough language was used. Uh, Dr. Craig actually has an interpretation of the traditional Catholic Trinity language. Dr. White doesn't, but the way he operates is that just by getting out there and strongly asserting this language using it consistently, pretending like it has some one meaning, and declaring that this is just the obvious meaning of the Bible. Just by doing that, you make yourself appear as an expert to the confused masses. If you just ask Dr. White any kind of basic question about what he thinks the Trinity is, he will never answer. I know because I've done it several times. I've posted on his deep thoughts. I've uh, blogged about uh, one of his debates. He will only robotically repeat the official language as if that language somehow answered all questions. And the second that you actually try to interpret him and derive any inference from that statement, he will shriek that you're not listening, and he will just repeat the language. You say, oh, so you mean this? Like, no, we mean this. And he says the same ambiguous thing again. He's just not interested in clarifying. What he's interested in doing is just pounding the table with the standard language, claiming the mantle and the prestige of Catholic tradition, and you know, casting scorn on anybody who doesn't just accept this as, as total awesomeness. If a person is serious about the truth of the matter, you know, is this theory about God really coherent with itself? Does it cohere with other things that we believe about God? 
does it really fit with the Bible? Does it really reflect the best understanding of New Testament theology? If someone was really concerned about getting to the truth of the matter and avoiding falsehoods, the first thing they would do is try to give some actual interpretation to this language so that you know what is being said by the term being and you know what is being said by the term person. And you know what's meant by saying the three are one God or that they're the same God. None of this language wears its meaning on its face. And he wouldn't have to start from scratch. As I pointed out back in podcast 265, in which I awarded Dr. White the Stevie Wonder Trophy for willful blindness to relevant scholarship, he can easily start with the discussion by analytic theologians of these matters. And there he would discover that what Dr. Craig says is quite different than what, say, Swinburne or Hasker or Leftow or Van Inwagen or Ray are saying. Or indeed, James Anderson, a Reformed analytic theologian who confessionally is closer to Dr. White. He couldn't care less. And he shows by his actions that he's not concerned about the truth of the matter. What he is concerned about is his own status and prestige as one who is able to discourse on deep, difficult-to-understand things. Someone who can come along and tell you, you know, about the wonderful things that you've been missing as just a Bible-oriented believer who's just been, you know, reading the Bible and accepting what you find therein. Oh, actually, you've got three persons in one essence. Haha, let me show you how you supposedly can find that in the Bible. This is the role that he started to play back when he, at the age of, I believe it was 23, began to work in apologetics, and he hasn't grown beyond it. He hasn't gotten more serious. Dr. Craig has, but when he's in apologist mode, he'll suddenly be talking like the Trinity is some one doctrine. It's not some one doctrine. It's one standard set of basically enforced terms and sentences and one muddles about and makes the best one can of it. And in practice, most Christians ignore it. To the extent they don't ignore it, they come up with something that's officially considered heretical, as Dr. White will discuss. In any case, Dr. White is going to try to explain how Dr. Craig's thoughts are muddled. And then it's said that this this serves to differentiate. Well, (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a that's an understatement. It is the essential self revelation of God. Self revelation. Hmm. That is seen. Therefore, God is a self. Primarily in. Therefore, the God is not three Incarnation selves. of Christ, His ministry, death, burial, resurrection. Does He have an answer uh, to, to the right that? hand of the Father in heaven? No. And then He and the Father sending the Holy Spirit. This becomes the the center point of history. And everything before looks forward to it. Everything afterwards looks back to it. So it doesn't just serve to do that. It is God's self-revelation. Self. In an amazing reality. Mm, One self. Of the incarnation of the second person. So the Father and Son are the same self. And so the one God, right? the, The definition certainly was minimal. He doesn't care about coherence problems. But you would think that if you're asking the question, is the Trinity, is the Trinity essential? that you would not only define the Trinity very carefully, you would define the word essential. Now, this is a worthy point. If you're saying that some teaching is, quote, essential, you have to ask, essential to what? Essential to what thing or to what purpose? And Dr. Craig didn't do that. And Dr. White is going to separate out two different things to which one might suppose, quote, the Trinity is essential. What you hear is, well, it's not essential for salvation, but that. then as he continues on, you come to understand that what he's saying is, is that you do not have to have perfect knowledge of the doctrine of the Trinity for salvation. That's what he's saying. Amen to that, too. Um, he talks about people in the church. He talks about the person listening to the shortwave radio in the mission field. You know, that might not fully understand this, that, or the other thing. And then he does get into some of the denials, but even then does not get to the important element of what the denials would actually involve. Do tell. What do you mean by essential? Is it essential to the defining of the Christian faith itself? Well, of course. Of course not. You know, he says it's at the core. I would say it is the core. 
both of which are ridiculous claims, as demonstrated by an honest and careful look at the history of mainstream Christian theology. There is no doctrine of the Trinity in about the first three centuries. Indeed, the only time it's even mentioned at all is in about the last quarter of the 300s. And so in the time of Augustine, 380s on, you just have this assumed to be, you know, what the Catholic Church has always taught. Right, but if you go back and look at the actual sources, it's not in origin. He doesn't think the three of them are the same God. It's not in Tertullian. He doesn't think the three of them are the same God. It's not in Justin. He doesn't think the three of them are the same God. Nor do any of these three think that all three of the Father, Son, and Spirit are divine in exactly the same sense of the word divine. Their accounts differ somewhat, but if you want to know some details, I'll put some links on the blog post for this episode, and you can also check out my presentation called The Lost Early History of Unitarian Christian Theology. If some quality is essential to something, what that's saying is you can't have that thing, that thing can't exist without that quality. So if, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity, again, let's imagine with them that that's one doctrine, that it's an actual one set of claims that could be true or false. If that's essential to Christianity, then at no time does Christianity exist without that teaching. But all Christianity existed without that teaching. It's not mentioned in the New Testament. In the 100s, in the 200s, it's not in the Logos theorists. It's not in the Monarchians, whether modalistic Monarchians or dynamic Monarchians. It's not in the subordinationists in the era of Origen or Eusebius, the famous church historian. It's not to be found anywhere in the many Catholic bishops who opposed the innovative new language introduced at Nicaea in 325. It's not in the works of those Catholic opponents all through that controversy. It's not even on the Nicene side in that controversy until deep into it. Really, I think until the time of the Cappadocian Fathers, but not in Basil. So yeah, just the fact that Christianity existed in the year 150, and Christianity existed in the year 250, and Christianity existed in the year 350, and yet no one, no one whatever in those times held to the language that Dr. Craig and Dr. White think is so important. Much less did any of them actually think that in the one God somehow there were three divine persons, whatever that means. They're both wrong. You can see it through post-biblical history, and you can even see it in the New Testament, right? Where's the New Testament passage where they say, hey guys, you know, the Jews were right about the monotheism thing, but they were wrong about this idea that God is a single person. Actually, God is three persons. It's nowhere in the New Testament. No, they have that same Jewish theology in the New Testament. There's one true God, the Father. That's not my interpretation. That's an explicit statement and a presupposition that you can see in all the New Testament writings. And you think, well, hey, it also presents Jesus as God. And the short answer, see my debate with Chris Date. No, it doesn't say that at all. Or you can see our forthcoming debate book. Okay, but back to Dr. White and his critique of Dr. Craig as being insufficiently clear. The doctrine of God is the central core that defines everything else. Right, so and that's in the New Testament. There's no question about that. And so if you're talking about essential as in defining, of course, of course, this is why we can't have fellowship with Unitarians. So of course it's essential in defining the Christian faith, but that's not really what he was addressing. What he was saying in essence was, is it essential to know the Trinity? Well, I would say on a certain level, yes. Since this is the highest of God's revelation, it's his personal revelation, it tells us who, who? God is, hmm. uh, to reject how God has revealed himself to exist is going to obviously put you in the position of not being able to worship the one true God. Another thing they're presupposing here is that not only is the Trinity actually implicit in the New Testament, but it's so clearly implied that if you actually, you know, look into it a bit and you don't end up a Trinitarian, 
then you're damnable for this. Like you, you can't even worship God. Like God will just plug his ears and not listen to you. Again, by carefully looking at the history, you can know that isn't true. If it was obvious and clear in the New Testament, you'd see people in the time of Justin believing that God is three persons in one essence. You don't. You'd see people in the time of Origen believing that. You don't. If you don't count the modalistic monarchians, you'd find people in the time of Eusebius, the church historian, believing that. You don't. So whether it's there is an argument we can have. We know it's not clearly there because so many faithful Christians for hundreds of years prayerfully studied these writings and did not become Trinitarians. What it took was an action by an overreaching Roman emperor, or rather a series of them, but that's another discussion. Even when he said, well, you know, so, so if you're not going to believe the Trinity, then you're going to be denying the deity of Christ. Or you're going to be denying the deity of the Holy Spirit. Well, actually, when you think about the doctrine of the Trinity, there are a number of ways to deny it. And if you understand the three biblical foundations it's based on, one God, three persons, so the existence of the Father, Son, and Spirit as having communion with one another, communicating with one another, uh, distinguished from one another, not only in their relationship but in the Godhead eternally, but in their actions and activities and creation and redemption. And then the equality of those persons is the third point. That would be the deity of Christ, deity of the Holy Spirit. Their equality not in being the same, but their equality in participation in the one being that is God. Whatever that means. So what Dr. White is doing here is just repeating a riff from his old apologetics book called The Forgotten Trinity. And uh, I'm sorry, but it's just false that there are really only three foundational claims to, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity. There are going to be a lot more claims than that. And there's more language than that, as Dr. White's about to discuss. If Dr. White wanted to up his game, he would engage with the arguments in my podcast 260, How to Argue That the Bible is Trinitarian. This old just, oh, there's just three foundational claims. It's just foolish. It's not right. It's just a traditional apologetics talking point. It's something that Trinitarians should reject. There's two ways to deny these things. The first is to know what the doctrine is and say it's wrong. And the other is to not know what the doctrine is and think it's something else and believing that. Okay, so notice that both of his options presuppose falsely that there is one Trinity doctrine. But anybody who reads the Trinity entries in the Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, or my piece in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, knows that there isn't one set of claims there. There isn't one doctrine. And so if you say, does the person understand it or not, what is it? Maybe they understand one of these theories, but not another. He likes to proceed like he understands these claims, can discern their meaning in a non-ambiguous way, but he only thinks that because he steadfastly avoids looking into the disambiguations, which shows me that he doesn't care too much about the truth of the matter. Maybe he's just sort of complacently assuming that he has the truth of the matter, being such an expert in the scriptures as he takes himself to be. But for someone who seriously looked into the competing theories, he just doesn't have anything to say to that person, nor is he willing to face the reality that there are multiple Trinity theories in play. It goes against the Catholic ideology. It goes against his confessional ideology. And so he's just going to not acknowledge the fact. Okay, but imagining some understandable Trinity theory that's clearly implied by Scripture Imagining that so, now he's going to contrast the two sort of different kinds of pitfalls, two different kinds of failures. One is a willful rejection of the doctrine. The other is ignorance. The other could be blamed upon traditions and the church not being willing to address things that it needs to address. There's all sorts of things. Hmm. Like ignoring relevant scholarship? Yeah, 
we must differentiate between willful rejection of known truth and an ignorant lack of confession of the truth or sure. a holding of an error again out of ignorance. Sure. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. White explains how the Trinitarian consensus is more theoretical than real when it comes to the average man or woman in the pew. I have said for decades now that I would be fearful to give a quiz at the vast majority of evangelical churches this coming Lord's Day on the doctrine of the Trinity for fear that probably 70 to 90 percent of the people who've actually made the effort to go to church would fail that quiz. Right. Because they read the Bible. And would test positive for some kind of heresy. Right, because they read the Bible. Official heresies, such as subordinationism or even modalism, on the face of it, these better fit the Bible than does any Trinity theory. And this is why you see views like that first in church history in the mid-100s, as opposed to the late 300s, that's the first time someone mentions a tripersonal God, God as being the three equally divine persons together. Now, how many of them would love to be corrected, to be instructed? A large portion of them. But this is what we are facing. Now think about this for a minute. Contrast the case of, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity with what the average man or woman in the pew believes about the real bodily resurrection of Christ or about Christ's atoning death. They do believe in those things, right? Those things have actually been revealed by God to his people. Not so with any Trinity theory. These are just a vague set of sentences that have been foisted on the lady by the elites originally by the Catholic bishops, with an assist from a couple of emperors, and now, yes, still by Catholic and Orthodox bishops, but also by Protestant authorities, such as bishops, pastors, seminary professors, and apologists. But the laity need to wake up and think for themselves, and prayerfully revisit what Scripture actually says about the one God and about His human Son, our Lord Jesus. And so, if perfection of understanding and theology were the standard, who would be saved? This is a point well taken. And notice that in his experience, he thinks, generally speaking, the average pew sitter will gladly accept correction. Actually, again, I think what's going on is they're afraid to look into the Trinity. It doesn't make any sense to them. Someone like James White comes along and says, oh, I know what's going on here bombards them with all this alien language, pretending that it has some one meaning, teaches them how to repeat these traditional sentences. And if he works enough, maybe he can even convince them that all of this is just obviously implied by the Bible. Well, if it was obviously implied by the Bible, then it'd be something that a Protestant should accept, for sure, because we think the Bible's inspired by God. But yeah, even though he's been at it 40 years... The same thing is still true, that this is not popularly understood. It's not popularly thought about. It's really not essential to American evangelical practice or spirituality or even thought. Most of the time, they go with biblical categories and they just leave aside all this traditional Catholic terminology. Except when an authoritative person comes in and pushes them and says, no, no, this is, this is important. You have to accept this. All Christians have always accepted this. Let me teach you this. 
if they're a bit too trusting, if they're not willing to keep whipping out their Bible and comparing it to what that person says, then they'll be transformed into, you know, ideological Trinitarians. And then their views really aren't only Bible-based. They're based on traditions dating from the late 300s AD. The essential issue that has to be addressed is the issue of defining that keyword essential. Are you talking about essential in reference to you must have X amount of knowledge to have saving faith? Now, obviously, we believe there is some minimal floor on that. There has to be some content to the gospel, and there has to be some content as to the God who is calling you to repentance. Right. And if you search the scriptures about what is essential, and you do this with an open mind, you'll probably come to a conclusion similar to that of the great Christian philosopher and, at the time, closet Unitarian, John Locke. See my podcasts 52 and following about this. In brief, what he discovered after examining the whole New Testament over a period of months was that what one has to believe in the New Testament is that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, obviously, that implies that there is one true God, that this is the God of Israel, this is the one Jesus called Father, that Jesus as Messiah did all the things that a Messiah was supposed to do, which is quite a lot. But still, yeah, if you want to encapsulate it into one sentence that can be sort of a summary, sort of a slogan, it's that Jesus is God's Christ. That's the New Testament answer. And I also discussed this in podcast 85 called Heretic Four Approaches to Dropping H-Bombs. The approach that Dr. White is in the tradition of following is just to say, well, we say these are essential. You want to know which claims are essential? These. And why is that? Well, it's because we say so. There's the Westminster Confession and the other traditional Reformed confessions. And of course, they'll insist that, you know, really these are obviously taught in Scripture, even though that's not so. But yeah, it's our way or the highway. It's not that there's one central body which decides who counts as a heretic or not, but it's just this kind of arbitrarily assembled list of claims. And interestingly, these claims are not given as things you must believe to be saved for purposes of evangelism. So there's kind of a bait and switch, and it really doesn't make sense. You can follow Christ, you can be born again if you believe A, B, and C. Oh, now once you're in, uh, guess what? Here's the Westminster Confession. Oh boy, it's a lot more. There's a lot more to it. Wait, nobody told me about this Trinity stuff when I signed up. No, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Again, this is a tension at the very core of supposedly Bible-based Protestantism. Something has to give. It's Bible versus post-biblical traditions. It would make sense that that minimal floor of data, truth, information is going to be related to a person's capacity and ability. That is sure. the the minimum necessary requirement for a five-year-old is different from a 10-year-old, which is different from a 15-year-old, which is different from a 20-year-old. Sure. But again, notice that in the New Testament, the thing that must be believed is that Jesus is God's Messiah. And a small kid can understand that well enough And that's why we evangelicals will baptize a kid of seven, as happened to me back in 1978 in my independent charismatic church. And so you take that into consideration. And in all of this, we have to differentiate. We have to make the category distinction that was not made in the video, that you can use the term essential in defining the faith. And it is essential that the doctrine of the Trinity is the very definition of the faith. The gospel is Trinitarian. You cannot make heads or tails out of the New Testament, outside the doctrine of the Trinity, who Jesus is, relationship to the Father, all these things. So in that realm of defining the faith, there is no question, centrally essential and definitional. Well, James White said so, so I guess that's pretty convincing. But that's a separate consideration from asking Can the individual at my church who, again, if tested, has a modalistic understanding of the Doctrine of Trinity be saved? Modalistic. So 
He probably means by that that God is first Father and then Son and then Spirit. Uh, so it's one self. So the persons are just kind of stages in the life of that self. Uh, but you can also call modalism just someone who thinks there are three personalities to God, three ways God is, three eternally concurrent modes of God. Both of these seem royally confused because in the New Testament, the Father and the Son are not the same self, nor are they the same being, nor are they the same God. In fact, one's the God over the other, which logically rules out there being the same God. But let's let him finish. Now, I'm not saying that we should try to make it so that people would be confused or make it so that people can have the easiest way of believing. None of those types of things. What I'm saying is, what if you have someone in your church? And I think this is the majority who, if you ask them, would stumble. It's because it doesn't make sense. I was at a church in the, the Tampa Bay area years ago before YouTube. And before YouTube, I could role play with people. I could come into a class and I could pretend to be a Jehovah's Witness or I could pretend to be a Mormon. And I would accurately represent what these groups believed and blow everybody away. And then halfway through, you stop and put them all back together again. But boy, did they listen. It was a very effective thing that I haven't gotten to do for years now, thanks to what you're watching me on the internet. And I'm not going to wear a wig and a, and a, and, you know, or anything like that and oh, try, to, try to look like somebody else. So that's not going to, not going to happen. So I don't get to do it anymore. But I went into this, this church and I spoke to the junior high class. I was a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, I was, I was from the local kingdom hall. And so they're like, ooh, oh, this is going to be cool. Get to watch our youth minister, you know, talk to a Jehovah's Witness. So this is, this is more interesting than what happened at school this week and so on and so forth. So we had their attention. Honestly, within 30 seconds of starting the dialogue with this poor young college student youth minister guy, I had him spouting heresy. Because it matches the Bible more closely than Catholic spouting orthodoxy. Spouting modalism. Yes, the Father and the Son are one person. Oh, that's confused. So you believe, you know, when Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father, that, that, that Jesus and the Father are one person. Well, yeah. Bing, 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 bing. That was that easy. So some officially heretical conclusions are more similar to Catholic orthodoxy than others. And people who, on paper, accept all the Catholic language do, in fact, very often confuse together Jesus and God as the same person. In fact, the language we've just heard in this episode from Dr. Craig and Dr. White illustrates that it sounds like they think each of the Father and Son is God himself, which would imply that they are the same person. But of course, no, you have to say they're not the same person. So what do they really think? I have some idea in Craig's case what he really thinks. White, I, I don't think there is anything. Like he's just about the language, just pounding the table on the language. But yeah, I mean, this kind of trickery, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, really. It's like, it's like taking candy from a baby, because what, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity usually amounts to on the ground is just, sometimes you think Jesus is God himself, and sometimes you think those are two different selves. And I know he's just a kid, you know, quit picking on the poor kid. Well, you know, hopefully he's figured out the Trinity since then. But the point is everybody else in the room's sitting there going, oh, okay. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And they didn't want to be the one answering the questions. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Yep. And so with that in mind, was he lost? Was he without salvation? Because when asked a very, what should be a basic question for all of us, failed to make the proper differentiation? No. The answer to that is no. If we properly catechized our people, this wouldn't be nearly as much of an issue. Right. Get their nose out of the Bibles, into the catechism. Anybody who has done the Westminster Catechism, shorter or longer, or Keech's Catechism, or any of the abundantly good catechisms and programs that are out there, one of the first questions that you learn, and you learn to distinguish between being in person and and the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit. Right. And, and so, say this, say that. Yeah, it does say something yes, about sir. the fact that a lot of our churches yeah, are very another. deficient at that point. But 
does that mean this person was unsaved? I say no. That only becomes a indicator of some kind of true spiritual issue if when faced with correction, when you go, you know, because obviously we went through halfway through the period of time for that class and I stopped and said, okay, I'm actually James White. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm a Christian apologist. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. And let's go back over the stuff that we talked about here. And I went back and hopefully kindly and without embarrassing the poor guy too much anyways, corrected all of the stuff that I had just said to help them to understand. And they, it got their attention. It, it was an efficient way of doing things, like I said. Um, did he become a Christian once I corrected him? No. But if he had gone, no, I, I, I don't, you, okay, you've just shown me where, where the Bible clearly differentiates right. between the Father and the Son. As between um, and God a, you know, the, and the Son, the son is, of God. has eternally existed no. as the Son. Doesn't say that. In relationship with the Father. Doesn't two say divine that. persons. I see all that, but I reject that. I'm going to believe in a Unitarian God. Okay, now you've got a problem. Because if you don't confess you the Son, then you don't have the Father Catholic also. Orthodoxy, but not the with just apostolic tradition, being, Dr. White. Then you don't have the Father, 1 John 2, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not what any of those passages we, we mean, of course. We start dealing with that particular, that particular issue. But in my experience, the vast majority of believers that you talk to, once you explain these things, they're like, oh, man, I'd always wondered about that. Yeah, of course. And and uh, it just opens up vistas of truth to them in, in the pages of the scriptures. Right. If you feel like you're drowning in confusion, anyone who comes along, even someone whose thoughts are as shallow as Dr. White's, who says, hey, I understand this. Just say this, say that, say this, don't say these other things. Oh, I mean, that seems like a great improvement over being completely confused. Especially if this guy has the imprimatur of the establishment. Say, you know, your pastor said, hey, this is, a, this is an important scholar. This is, a, this is a very learned man here. Right? Problem solved. Until you actually start to think about it a bit. As long as you completely ignore all Unitarian Christian interpretation of the New Testament, and a lot of interpretation produced by non-evangelicals, who hold to various views, Catholic, agnostic, mainstream, Protestant. Yeah, if you can just stay within the evangelical ghetto of scholarship, you can hold out for a long time in this position. Because you'll never hear, or at least you can pretend that you never hear anything that contradicts what he told you. But as soon as you get serious and start investigating the truth of the matter, it'll bust wide open on you. The first step to doing that is just to disambiguate these terms, trinity, one essence, person. What do they mean? I've got two chapters in my book called What is the Trinity? Discussing what it means to say that Father and Son are one usia, one essence or substance. Another chapter is on what it means to say that there are multiple divine, quote, persons. The differences actually matter quite a lot. You get a very different theology depending on how you come down on understanding those terms. But if you just enjoy the fun game of pretending that their mean is obvious and moreover obviously taught by the Bible and what Christians have always said, and only the dastardly cultists and Muslims and Jews deny it, if you enjoy that, well, you're not going to enjoy the actual truth, serious investigations. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. White wraps up his critique of Dr. Craig's video. So the unfortunate thing about this video is that by not defining the category that you're addressing and by not defining the word essential and by muddling those two things up, you don't bring clarity. You, you bring a lack of clarity. Lack of clarity. Oh, man. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Is the Trinity essential? Of course 
It is definitional of the Christian faith. Of course. Is it possible for a Christian to be ignorant about aspects of Trinitarian theology? Well, better be, because probably all of us are. If, if I ask you right now to define perichoresis or go to hell, will your pulse rate go up just a little bit? Now, perichoresis is just simply the interpenetration of the divine persons. As if that means anything that we can understand. I mean, he's so proud that he can tell you about this Greek term. It's really prominent in the writings of the 8th century Orthodox scholar John of Damascus. But the term and the idea are not in the New Testament. But the average person that he's going to impress by breaking out this language isn't going to know that. Yeah, what does that involve? It's not a physical thing. It has to do with the relationship of the divine persons and their relationship to the divine being. Mm-hmm. But... It has to do with those, huh? I would guess that 98.5% of all the people who were involved in my young life in teaching me the truth never, ever heard of the term perichoresis. For sure. Probably 99.9. Does that mean they weren't Christians? No. But it does mean that making a perfection of understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the standard, means that there probably aren't any Christians on the planet. Most of these points are just now, truisms. what that should do for us is encourage us to know more about what God has revealed about himself. Himself. If you know mm. more about prophecies about a seven-year tribulation period than you know about the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit, you've got all your priorities upside down. Can't say amen, at least say ouch. So it should be something that is absolutely central. And certainly any person, uh, by the time they're in their teen years, is fully capable of having a, a real understanding of what the, the doctrine of the Trinity is. An understanding such as he provides, sure. Say this, don't say that. What its ramifications are, how it's related to the gospel. Vitally important stuff. No reason to think that. Essential? Yes. Notice that he hasn't lifted a finger to give you any biblical reason that it's essential. And this is someone who's a Reformed Christian, someone who's a Protestant. And in theory, their views are based on Scripture. In practice, it's based on tradition. It's based on layers of tradition. Traditions in what you're supposed to say as an apologist. Traditions like the famous early modern Reformed Confessions. Traditions going back to the time of the Nicene-Constantinopolitan Creed, but not the Bible. He's being honest here in the sense that he's just asserting this by his authority as a learned scholar within this tradition. He actually can't point you to any passage in the Bible that says that the Trinity is essential to the message or that you can't reject the Trinity and be born again. But it's traditional to say these things. And he is. Vitally important stuff. Essential? Yes. Most definitely. In opposition to what Dr. Craig said. But recognizing that Dr. Craig just simply was muddled and was using the term essential in two different ways. And that's where the problem came in in that particular, that particular instance. That's really bad, using the term essential where it might mean two different things. Gee, I guess it would be just as bad and maybe at least as unfortunate if you use the term essence or being in a way that could be interpreted in two or three or four different ways. Or the term person, a term that clearly can be interpreted in multiple ways. It's most unfortunate, isn't it, to use those terms without providing clarification for which of those ideas it is that you're meaning to express. But again, he can't look into it. He doesn't have the patience. He'd have to learn something new. He'd have to get off his high horse as a dealer of deep divine truths that other people don't understand. He'd have to get down in the trenches and dig and try to carefully separate the true from the false. He doesn't want to do it. In his old book, The Forgotten Trinity, written in the late 90s, he gives a similar presentation in the main body of the book. And uh, he kind of realizes when he gets to the end of the main chapters that he hasn't really clarified what he means by saying that God is three persons in one essence. And so in chapter 12, towards the end of the book, a chapter called A Closer Look, 
He does take a stab at trying to clarify what he means by the main terms that are traditional to say. It's not terribly clear. He doesn't get very far. At this time, he realized that a lot more needed to be said, but he didn't quite know where to go. He's had quite a few years since then to remedy that. He hasn't. Maybe another time I'll do a blog post or a podcast on this chapter where he attempts to clarify what he thinks, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity amounts to. But I'm not going to do it here. I'll just observe that at this time, he knew that a lot more needed to be said. It wasn't just enough to just repeat the language and pretend that something meaningful has been expressed. Indeed, something that can turn out to be the best interpretation of the New Testament. So that's all for today's episode. Do you think the Trinity is essential to being a Christian? Are you a Christian who doesn't believe in the Trinity? When you signed up, when you made the deal, did they tell you about the Trinity? Let us know what you think in the comments on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org or in the very active Trinities Podcast Facebook group. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with a new episode on the first Monday of March. This week's thinking music has been the track Great Expectations by Kai Engel. If you love the Trinity's podcast and would like to support it on a per episode basis, please go to patreon.com slash trinities. And if you're a Unitarian Christian who believes the Bible and not Catholic traditions about the one God and his son, join together with us at the Unitarian Christian Alliance. Check us out at unitarianchristianalliance.org. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.